How about those Patriots and Rams? Three. That is 13 to 3. Hell of a revelation. So many records broken. Most rings, six for Brady. Oldest coach to win the Super Bowl. It's the Belichick. It was 3 3 until the third quarter. It finished. 13-3, hell of a revelation. How about that Super Bowl? 66-year-old coach. Six rings. Quarterback. Coffee with Dragon. Public announcement that I'm offering a one-hour massage. All the Patriots, the team, staff, the coach, the players, all of them, all of the members, including the owner. Yeah, maybe not the owner. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> just playing. Robert Kraft also. If he makes a big donation to support the World Citizenship and build the rink. And there are my sisters, the cheerleaders as well, one hour. Massage on Hawk Island, also knows Miss Montreal. And this is gonna be the official policy from now on from Dragon. The winning Dragon World policy, World Football policy will be that. From now on, every Super Bowl, the winning team, all the members, the staff, the sisters, cheerleaders, hopefully more men, cheerleaders, more male. This was the first on the record, which I'm very cool with that as a member of the LGBTQ community be comfortable being running back and on half and half or half a game two quarters running and then switching and going to be the cheerleader that'll be a new hero applying for well i'm a 49er so i'm gonna apply for the 49ers to do that i'm gonna apply for the patriots to do that and i'm gonna apply for choose another team for me coffee with dragon Special, special, special Black History Month. This coffee is dedicated to Black History Month. Again, lots. Final class on the Super Bowl. And now I'm going to continue. What do you think? This is so unique. It was the lowest ever scoring game. 53 it was never so low scoring game. I think Fellini was very defensive game and I said before that in American football those who say it's rigged and this and that do not understand American football I said three and a half inches it's some of my sisters but on the field if you're on fourth down and you gotta make it and you get the running back running and then all the team pushing to get that first down and then from that first down if you get those two and a half inches that you're missing for a first down you're going to touch down drive everybody's pushing hard pushing hard and pushing and he's getting push back and then push back and push back and push back and, push back and like he gets a concussion headband from it Going to win the Super Bowl in three and a half inches. He's gonna go for it. Boom, the head. Push. Touchdown. Not the down, but he gets the first down and then they go on a touchdown drive. That's football. That's American football. That during those three and a half inch, that play for those three and a half inches to get the first down. Could be at the most important play of the game. That Thursday is as insignificant it might seem on the terrain to gain two and a half inches. It can be extremely decision for the for the for the outcome of the game. Coffee with dragon. Black History Month. 
dedicated to learning, education, with meditation for healing, with curving and brotherhood, googling, black history. Black History Month Date Friday, February 1st, 2019 to Thursday, February 28th, 2019 I'm just going to mention that since it's the Lunar New Year I have already did three Coffee with Dragons relating to Asia specifically for the Lunar New Year calling for cordial harmonious and peaceful Sino-North American relations in those three videos studying learning specifically China, Chinese culture, Chinese state, the People's Republic of China, as the superpower of Asia, and at large dedicated to the Lunar New Year. So this video today is um, February 6th, so this video might be posted on February 11th. Black History Month, also known as African American History Month in the U.S., is the annual observance in Canada, Ireland, 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 the New Netherlands, the United Kingdom, and the United States. It began as a way for remembering important people and events in the history of the African diaspora. Black History Month, also known as African American History Month in the U.S., is an annual observance in Canada, Ireland, the Netherlands, the United Kingdom. In the United States. It began as a way for remembering important people and events in the history of the African diaspora. It is celebrated annually in the United States, in, in Canada, in February, as well as in the United Kingdom, the Netherlands, and Republic of Ireland in October. Black History Month. There's a painting dedicated to the founders of Black History Month, the Black United Students at Kent State University by Ernie Pryor. Also called African American History Month, observed by United States, Canada, United Kingdom, Canada, a Canadian world citizen, old rainbow citizen, better to have a right from Canada, in Canada, world citizen. So we celebrated a significant celebration of African American or Afro Canadian history. Date months of February, which is now in October, annual history. Negro History Week, 1926. The precursor to Black History Month was created in 1926 in the United States when historian Carter G. Woodson and the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History announced the second week of February to be Negro History Week. This week was chosen because it coincided with the birthday of, interesting, Abraham Lincoln. See what we're learning. Abraham Lincoln on February 12th and the Frederick Douglass on February 14th. It's interesting because. So, uh, February for healing, recovery. On February twelfth and of February. 
Fred Frederick Douglass on February 14th, both of, both of which dates black communities had celebrated together since the late 19th century. From the event's initial phase, primary emphasis was placed on encouraging the coordinated teaching of the history of Amer American blacks in the nation's public schools. The first Negro History Week was met with a lukewarm response, gaining the cooperation of departments of education of the states of North Carolina, Delaware, and West Virginia, as well as the city school administration of Baltimore and Washington, D.C. Despite this far from universal acceptance, the event was regarded by Woodson as one of the most fortunate steps ever taken by the association, and plans for a repeat of the event on an annual basis continued apace. apace. At the time of Negro History Week's launch, Woodson contended that the teaching of black history was essential to ensure the physical and intellectual survival of the race within broader society. If a race has no history, it has no worthwhile tradition, it becomes a negligible factor in the thought of the world, and it stands in danger of being exterminated. The American Indian left no continuous record. He did not appreciate the value of tradition, and where is he today? The Hebrew. Hebrew. Well, that's Hebrew means basically Jewish. The Hebrew keenly appreciated the value of tradition, as is attested by the Bible itself. In spite of worldwide persecution, therefore, he is a great factor in our civilization. By 1929, the Journal of Negro History was able to note that with only two exceptions, officials with the State Departments of educations of every state with considerable Negro, Negro population had made the event known to that state's teachers and distributed official literature associated with the event. Churches also played a significant role in the distribution of literature in association with Negro History Week during this initial interval, with the mainstream and black press aiding in the public effort. Negro History Week was met with enthusiastic response. It prompted the creation of black history clubs and increase in interest among teachers and interest from progressive whites. Progressive whites. So, 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 yeah, progressive whites. Negro History Week. I'm guessing to outline that there was more interest among progressive non-blacks than conservatives, probably. That's what it says. Could see why. I mean, could see definitely. Yeah. I mean, myself. I'm. Oh, don't, don't like labels. See myself most as a human being, as an artist, universal spiritual teacher. You know, labels, this and that. Although, of course, there's a lot of things that I don't support. Most things, of course, probably all things that are <laughs> conservative. Um, stands for today and this and that, the nationalism and all that. So, let's see more understanding. But, anyways, I'm reading this in order to be together in this coffee, dedicating this cup of coffee, my time, coffee to my black brothers and sisters, and black history month. And it is what it is. I'm learning, so I'm learning the you know, Frederick Douglass Associate and Abraham Lincoln and this and that. So let's learn by reading Dragon and Coffee. Is where were we? Where were we? Negro History Week grew in popularity throughout the following decades with mayors mayors across the United States endorsing it as a holiday. On February 21st, 2016, 106-year wow, Washington, D.C. resident and school volunteer Virginia, Virginia McLaren, McLaren 
visited what McLaurin M C L A U R I N visited the White House as part of Black History Month. When asked by the president why she was there, McLaurin said, "A black president, a black wife, and I'm here to celebrate Black History. That's what I'm here for." United States Black History Month. The Black United Students first Black Culture Center, Kumbak House, Kumba House, where many events of the first Black History Month celebration took place. Interesting. Doesn't say where it was, but let's, uh, let's see. Black History Month was first proposed by Black educators and the Black United Students. Oh, at Kent State University, so this state. Kent State University in February 1969. The first celebration of Black History Month took place at Kent State one year later from January 2nd, 1970 to February 28th, 1970. Six years later, Black History Month was being celebrated all across the country in educational institutions. Centers of Black Culture and Community Centers, both great and small, when President Gerald Ford, Ford F-O-R-D, that is Ford, recognized Black History Month during the celebration of the United States Bicentennial. Bicentennial, basically, centennial is 100 and bi means like two, so bicentennial after the 200 years of the, basically when it means United States Independence 1776, so 1976 is 200 years. He urged Americans to seize the opportunity to honor the often neglected accomplishments of black Americans in every area of endeavor throughout our history. United Kingdom. 1987. 1987. Bless you. United Kingdom, 1978. Black History Month was first celebrated in the United Kingdom in 1987. It was organized through the leadership of Ghanaian analyst Akiaba Adaisebo, who had served as a coordinator of special projects for the Greater London Council and created a collaboration to get it underway. It was first celebrated in London, London, Canada, 1995, which is doing this video recording in the year February 6th. 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And so... In Canada. In 1995, after a motion by politician Jean Augustin, representing the writing of Etobicoke, so it's spelled E T O B I C O K E, Etobicoke, Etobicoke, Lakeshore in Ontario, Canada's House of Commons officially recognized February as Black History Month and honored Black Canadians. In 2008, Senator Donald Oliver moved to have the Senate officially recognize Black History Month, which was unanimously approved. Republic of Ireland, 2014. In, 19, in 2014, the Republic of Ireland became only the fourth country in the world to officially celebrate Black History Month. Ireland's Great Hunger Institute notes Black History Month. Ireland was initiated in Cork in 2010. It's interesting because it said uh, 2010 February. February. So, (sighs) 
Black History Month Ireland was initiated in Cork in 2010. Initiate. Initiate. That's the word used. I N I T I A T E D. Initiated in 2010. So, remember, it was in 2010, February. Reading, studying, learning, exercising, physical exercise, good diet, lots of physical exercise, cardio walks, more exercising, more physical exercising, more physical exercising, reading, learning, studying, the science of neuroplasticity, and the magic of will, healing, recovering head to toe. So much illness, so let's recover together. Blacks, whites, one mankind. Together, joy, healing, liberty, life, love. From here, from Hawk Island, Montreal, to all North America, our Mexican brothers included. to all the world. It's become one. Joy. Shed. What needs to be shedded spiritually, physically, politically, socially. Joy. The new world order. Citizens. Free citizens. Our digressions from the heart, from the passion. That's all my videos are, of course, unedited, as with <coughs> the themes. With much love. Black History Month Ireland was initiated in Cork in 2010. This location seems particularly appropriate, as in the 19th century, the city was a leading center of abolition. Interesting. And the male and female anti-slavery societies welcomed a number of black abolitionists to lecture there, including Charles Lennox, Raymond, and Frederick Douglass. Interesting. Oh, criticism. I'm going to read it just to read. I learned it from criticism. Black History Month doesn't harm doesn't harm anybody I don't know Black History Month doesn't harm nor harm anybody nobody forcing you to celebrate it I did this on my own free will my own love for black people you know had will have issues sometimes you know fear, hidden fear and psychological fear you know I've hidden lusts, desires, unadmitted, partially admitted, semi-admitted. Or at least we hurt nobody, you know. I don't know. From the irrational deep psychology, you know. So, let's show the criticism. Black History Month often sparks an annual debate about the continued usefulness and fairness of a designated 
month dedicated to the history of one race. Criticisms include questions over whether it is appropriate to confine the celebration of black history to one month, as opposed to integration of black history into the mainstream education the rest of the year. I like the word integration. I like it. I envision a new world order based on humanity being integrated and integrated. Socialist, socialist, international, social integrated state, international social integrated state, the national social integrated state. Actually, no, an international. Supra integrated state. So integration, yeah. Or black history into the mainstream education the rest of the year. Islam was a big supporter of interracial marriages, unions and dating. Myself included. Another criticism is that contrary to the original inspiration for Black History Month, which was a desire to redress the manner in which American schools failed to represent black historical figures as anything other than slaves or colonial subjects, Black History Month reduces complex historical figures to overly simplified objects of hero worship. That's pretty potent criticism. Um, what do you say? Mm. But uh, see if if we do more to not to let's say this let's say that it's the reduction of that. Then I would ask them this: who have this criticism? Okay, how can we incorporate, integrate in a Black History Month? You write an essay about how we can not do that, right? And not reduce these complex historical figures to simplified objects of hero worship. Maybe have a lecture, maybe have a movie. Have an idea to create. Always creativity to find solutions, art, art, dance, good policies, social policies for me or something. Find solutions. Find solutions. Other critics refer to this celebration as racist. Mm, how can I? Mm, no, okay, I can see why. <laughs> I just like about that. I mean, I mean, the critics will say all sorts of dumb, dumb crap, dumb bullshit. I don't know what some that, but I mean, I don't know. Might have certain fears and anxieties and. This and that, and last desire secret. But you know, anyways, actor and director Morgan Freeman and actress Stacey Dash have criticized the concept of declaring only one month as Black History Month. Freeman noted, I don't want a Black History Month. Black history is American history. Hmm. He doesn't want it. Morgan Freeman doesn't want it. And Morgan Freeman is an actor which do a lot. Find that. His voice is powerful, his ways are powerful. If I'm not mistaken, he's one of the another I remember in a little bit. He's one of the first African American actors, black actors, who played a, a president in the in a movie, right? If I'm not mistaken. Now there might have been others in the past, but I'm pretty sure he might have. Not a hundred percent, correct me, double check, check fact. But Morgan Freeman might have been the first who played who was portrayed as a black president. Was a disaster movie. What was it? A powerful disaster movie. Mm. 
Is American history. Is American history, he says. For the reading. Okay, we're gonna go into now we're gonna click for African American history. African American history is the part of American history that looks at the African Americans or black Americans in the United States. Although previously marginalized, African American history has gained ground in school and university curricula and gained wider scholarly attention since the late 20th century. The black history that predates the slave trade is rarely taught in schools and is almost never acknowledged. As a result, many African Americans grow up believing that slavery is the only event to occur in their history before the civil rights movement, which is not accurate. Or of the 10.7 million Africans who were brought to the Americas until the 1860s, 450,000 were shipped to what is now the United States. Yeah, because I mean, uh, before the United States until it was the colonies right of Britain. Mm -hmm. Before 1776, or 13 colonies, right? Oh, 13 colonies. Slavery. African origins. Most African Americans are descendant from Africans brought directly from Africa to America to become slaves originally captured in African war, wars or raids and transported in the Atlantic, Atlantic, that is the ocean, Atlantic, slave trade. I wonder if Atlanta comes from, from, uh, from Atlantic, you know, Atlanta, right? The name where the Super Bowl was played. What a revelation, 13-3. Super Bowl, Atlanta. And love the, um, the logo of Atlanta resurgence. It's a Latin for rebirth. And just, um, got a tattoo myself, Phoenix there. African Americans are descended from various ethnic groups, mostly from Western and Central Africa, including the Sahel, S-A-H-E-L. A smaller number came from Eastern and Southeastern Africa. The major ethnic groups that the enslaved Africans belonged to included the Hausa, Hausa, Bakongo, Igbo, Mande, Wolof, Akan, Fon, Yoruba, and Makua, among many others. Hope that I pronounced correctly this all the names that are given there. Ethnic groups. They're characterized as ethnic groups. One and once again. Hausa, Bakongo, Igbo, Mande, Wolof, Akan, Fon, Yaruba, and Makwa. So these ethnic groups, the major ethnic groups that the enslaved Africans belong to included the Hausa H A U S A, Bakongo, B A K O N G O, Igbo. I G B O Monday M A N D E Wolof W O L O F Akan A K A N Fon F O N Yoruba Y O R U B A and Makua M A K U A among many others. Although these different groups varied in customs, religious the theology, and language, what they had in common was a way of life that was different from the Europeans. However, since a major, majority of the slaves came from these villages and societies, once sent to the Americas, these different peoples had European standards and beliefs forced upon them, causing them to do away with tribal differences and forged a new 
history and culture that was a uh, first time I hear this stuff creolization of their common past presence present and European culture it's a creolization so this the spelling of the term is first time I've never heard this English term before I might have heard it but I mean understand it I don't know it's a process of integrating this um, different African ethnic tribes which had different languages different religious or different spirituality they were diverse from one another and this process was to make them sort of like many or common denominators quite similar in cultural language and I just asked with creolization CR comes from Creole that's why the language Creole now, of course I'm assuming from my scholarly ways from my own I'm assuming that this is the term that's 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 the term and we'll check the term creolization c-r-e-o-l-i-z-a-t-i-o-n creolization of their common past and European culture creolization c-r-e-o-l-i-z-a-t-i-o-n slaves from specific African ethnic groups were more sought after and more dominant in numbers than others in certain regions of what later became the United States regions of Africa studies of contemporary documents reveal seven regions from which Africans were sold or taken during the Atlantic slave trade and once again this first it's gonna be three part series in the coffee will drive in special black history month and in the next I'm gonna I'm starting slowly and then moving up to the contemporary civil rights and Martin Luther King whose speech at the during the Super Bowl commercial made me a bit teary I'd you males out there you patriarchs it's okay to have emotions and feelings and to cry I Right. Anyways, if you don't feel Martin Luther King's speech in your core, your soul, and your being, this I don't know. I mean, I welcome it to my new world order. Me. Okay. More coffee. More coffee. Okay, a little bit. These regions were studies of contemporary documents reveal seven regions from which Africans were sold or taken. Seven. Why is seven the number? Studies of contemporary documents reveal seven regions from which Africans were sold or taken during the Atlantic slave trade. These regions were Senegambia, encompassing the coast from the Senegal River to the Casamance River, where captives as far away as the upper and middle Niger River Valley were sold. The Sierra Leone region included territory from the Casamance to the Yassini River in the modern countries of Guinea Bissau, Guinea, Sierra Leone, Liberia, and Cote d'Ivoire, Ivory Coast. The Gold Coast region consisted of mainly modern Ghana the bright the bite that is b-i-g-h-t of Benin Benin is a country now b-e-n-i-n Benin region stretched from the Volta Volta River to the Benu River in modern Togo Benin Benin and southwestern southwestern Nigeria Nigeria is the most populated African country is the most populated country in Africa that year I believe it's more than it's like 156 million people now today in Nigeria maybe maybe more maybe I'm gonna check the bite of Biafra extended from south eastern so they have southwestern and then 
southeastern Nigeria, come present day Nigeria. Was it Nigeria back then, of course? Extended from southeastern Nigeria through Cameroon into Gabon. To Cameroon into Gabon. Cameroon, I don't know, because dated the Cameroonian girl who were kind of youngish at that time. So, Cameroon into Gabon. West Central Africa, the largest region including included the Congo. West Central Africa. So it's not, the largest region included the Congo, C O N G O, and Angola. And Angola. And East and South East Africa, the region of Mozambique, Madagascar included the modern countries of Mozambique, part of Tanzania, and Madagascar. Madagascar is actually uh, an island. Madagascar, well, it's an island country state. It's very populated. It's more than 25 million people or so, but nonetheless, it's an island. The largest source of slaves transported across the Atlantic Ocean from for the New World was West Africa. Some West Africans were skilled iron workers and were therefore able to make tools that aided in their agri agricultural labor. While there were many unique tribes with their own customs and religions, by the 10th century, many of the tribes had embraced Islam. Those villages in West Africa that were lucky enough to be in good conditions for growth and success prospered. They also contributed their success to the slave trade. Origins and percentages of African Americans imported, from, imported into British North America. Why well, actually statistics there? Some would contest these, I don't know. Well, we'll, we'll, all of us will tell them and then the source will is from, let's see, note 7 is from exchanging our country marks. The transformation of African identities in the colonial and antebellum South, 1998. Gomez 8. Page 29. Hmm. Origins and percentages of African Americans imported into British North America and Louisiana between 1700 and 1820. So the region is West Central Africa. The percentage was 26.1%. So more than a quarter, more than one out of four, were from West Central Africa. 26.1%. Bite of Biafra, 24.4%. Sierra Leone, 15.8%. Sierra Leone is 15.8%. Senegambia, 14.5%. Gold Coast, 13.1%. Bight of Benin, 4.3%. Mozambique, Madagascar, 1.8%. And of course the total is 100. So the top, the top are actually close, 26 and 0.1% to 24.1% West Central African Bight of Biafra which are very close and of course Mozambique Madagascar are the least and um, those on those sevens right the middle passage before this before the Atlantic slave trade there were already people of African descent in America a few countries in Africa would buy sell and trade other enslaved Africans who were after often prisoners of war with the Europeans. The people of Mali, M-A-L-I, which was actually in the news yesterday, uh, and, uh, a few days ago in the paper, in the local paper here in Hawk Island, also known as Montreal, about the Canadian um, mission, that is the United Nations mission, um, transfer from Canada to Romania mission from coming the, the peacekeeping mission for the United Nations and NATO NATO mostly no this is mostly NATO but coordinated with with uh, the United Nations so the United Nations NATO. all right so the people of Mali and Benin are known for partaking in the event of selling their prisoners of war and other unwanted people off as slaves. This comes from the struggle for freedom, a history of African Americans. 
Pearson Education Cars Kleber Emma Le Emma Lepansky Werner and Gary Nash Transport in the account of Olauda Ekokiano he described the process of being transported to the colonies and being off on the slave ships as a horrific experience on the ships the slaves were separated from their family long before they boarded the ships once aboard the ships the captives were then segregated by gender under the deck the slaves were cramped and did not have enough space to walk around freely male slaves were generally kept in the ship's hold where they experienced the worst of crowding the captives stationed on the floor beneath low-lying bunks could barely move and spend much of the voyage pinned to the floorboards which could over time wear the skin on their elbows down to the bone due to the lack of basic hygiene hygiene malnourishment and dehydration diseases spread wildly and death was common the women on the ships often endure rape by the crewmen women and children were often kept in rooms set apart from the main home this gave crewmen easy access to the women which was often regarded as one of the perks of the trade system not only did did these rooms give the crewmen easy access to women but it gave enslaved women better access to information on the ship's crew fortifications and daily routine but little opportunity to communicate this to the men confined in the ship's hold as an example women instigated a 1797 insurrection aboard the british ship thomas by stealing weapons and passing them to the men below as well as engaging in hand-to-hand -hand combat with the ship's crew in the midst of these terrible conditions african slaves plotted mutiny mutiny male slaves were the most likely candidates to mutiny and only at times they were on deck while rebellions did not happen often they were usually unsuccessful in order for the crew members to keep the slaves under control and prevent future rebellions the crews were often twice as large and members would instill fear into the slaves through brutality and harsh punishments from the time of being captured in africa to the arrival to the plantations of the european masters took an average of six months africans were completely cut off from their families home and community life they were forced to adjust to a new way of life early african-american history is a picture of landing negroes at jamestown from dutch men of war 1619 19. slaves working in 17th century virginia by an unknown artist 1670 in 1619 the first african slaves were brought to point comfort today's fort monroe in hampton virginia 30 miles downstream from jamestown virginia from jamestown virginia the english settlers treated these captives as indentured servants and released them after a number of years this practice was gradually replaced by the system of race-based slavery used in the Caribbean. The servants were freed. They became competition for resources. Additionally, released servants had to be replaced. This combined with the still ambiguous nature of the social status of, social status of blacks and the difficulty in using any other group of people as forced servants led to the relegation of blacks into slavery massachusetts 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 always uh that one though. how's your pronunciation with that one going m-a-s-s-a-c-h-u-s-e-t-t-s let's spell it you pronounce it was the first colony to legalize slavery in 1641 other colonies followed suit by passing laws that passed slavery on to the children of slaves and making non-christian imported servants slaves for life africans first arrived in 1619 when a dutch ship sold 19 blacks as indentured servants not slaves indentured servants not slaves to englishmen at point comfort today's fort monroe 30 miles downstream from jamestown virginia in all 
about 10 to 12 million Africans were transported to the Western Hemisphere. The vast majority of these people came from that stretch of the West African coast, extending from present-day Senegal to Angola. Present-day Senegal to Angola. Angola. Extending from present-day Senegal to Angola, and a small percentage percentage came from Madagascar and East Africa. Only 5%, about 500,000, went to the American colonies. The vast majority went to the West Indies and Brazil. Interesting. Only 5%, about 500,000, went to the American colonies. Hmm. Interesting. The American colonies. The vast majority went to the West Indies and Brazil, where they died quickly. Demographic conditions were highly favorable in the American colonies with less disease, more food, some, some medical, medical care and light workloads that, that prevailed in the sugar fields. The vast majority went to the West Indies and Brazil, West Indies basically. Caribbean, mostly Asian, like Cuba, present day Cuba, Haiti. From Dominican Republic, they in the islands, Barbados, Jamaica, right? Those are West Indies, the West Indies. The majority, only 5% went to the American colonies. The vast majority went to the West Indies and Brazil where they died quickly. Demographic conditions were highly favorable in the American colonies with less disease, more food, some medical care, and light workloads than prevailed in the sugar fields. At first, the Africans in the south were outnumbered by white indentured servants who came voluntarily, voluntarily, voluntarily from Britain. They avoided the plantations. With a vast amount of good land and the shortage of laborers, plantation owners turned to lifetime slaves who worked for their keep but were not paid wages and could not easily escape. Slaves had some legal rights. It was a crime to kill a slave, and a few whites were hanged for it. Slaves had some legal rights. It was a crime to kill a slave, and a few whites were hanged for it. Slaves had some legal rights. It was a crime to kill a slave, and a few whites were hanged for it. Generally, the slaves developed their own family system, religion, and customs in the slave quarters with little interference from owners who were only interested in work outputs. Before the 1660s, the North American mainland colonies were expanding, but still fairly small in size and did not have a great demand for labor. So the colonists did not import a large number of numbers of African slaves at this point. Black population in 1700s. By 1700 there were 25,000 black slaves in the North American mainland colonies, about 10% of the population of the population. By 1700 there were 25,000 black slaves in the North American mainland colonies about 10% of the population. Some had been shipped directly from Africa. Most of them were from 1518 to 1850s. But initially, very often, they had been shipped via the West Indies in small cargoes after spending time working on the islands. At the same time, many were native-born on the North American mainland. Their legal status was now clear. They were slaves for life, and so were the children of slave mothers. As white settlers began to claim and clear more land for large-scale farming and plantations, the number of slaves imported directly from Africa began to rapidly increase between the 1660s into the 1700s and onward, since the trade in slaves coming in from the West Indies was much too small to meet the huge demand for the now fast-growing North American mainland slave market. Additionally, most African slave buyers no longer wanted slaves coming in from the West Indies. By now, they were either harder to obtain, too expensive, undesirable, and more often 
ruined in many ways by the very brutal regime of the island's sugar plantations. By the end of the 17th century, a relaxation of colonial, colonial tax laws and the British Crown's removal of monopolies that had been granted to a very small number of British slave traders like the Royal African Company had made the direct slave trade with Africa much easier. As a result, freshly imported young and healthy Africans were now much more affordable cheaper in price and more readily available in large numbers to African slave buyers who by now preferred to purchase them even if it took some time for them to adjust to a new life as plantation slaves. From about 1700 to 1859 the majority of slaves imported to the North American mainland came directly from Africa in huge cargoes to fill the massive spike in demand for much needed labor and work the continually expanding plantations in the southern colonies. Later to be states, with most heading to Virginia, South Carolina, and French or Spanish Louisiana. Unlike in the south, the northern colonies developed into much more urbanized and industrialized societies and they relied less on agriculture as the main economy. So therefore they did not import many African slaves and the black population there remained fairly low for a lo very long time. However, big northern cities like New York, Philadelphia, and Boston had relatively large black pop populations. Slaves were free for most of their colonial of the colonial period and thereafter. From the 1750s, American-born slaves of African descent already began to outnumber African-born slaves. By the time of the American Revolution, a few of the northern states had begun to consider abolishing slavery. And some southern states like Virginia had produced such large and self-sustaining locally born slave populations by natural increase that they stopped taking in direct imports of slaves from Africa altogether, but still kept slavery which continued in the south. However, other southern states like Georgia and South Carolina still relied on constant fresh supplies of slave, slave labor to keep up with the demand of their burgeoning plantation economies so they continued to allow the direct importation of slaves from Africa right up to 1808 only stopping for a few years in the 1770s because of a temporary lull in the trade brought on by the American Revolutionary War. The continued direct importation of slaves from Africa ensured that for most of the 18th century South Carolina's black population remained very high with blacks outnumbering whites three to one, unlike in Virginia, which had a white majority despite its large black slave population. It was said that South Carolina in the 18th, 18th century as a British colony looked much more like an extension of West Africa than it did of Britain. <laughs> Whole legal direct importation of slaves might have been legal for them, but of course not for tomorrow. Just, I mean, legal. It's who's who's laws? Who's. Illegal direct importation of slaves from Africa had stopped by 1808, when the now newly formed United States finally banned its citizens from participating in the international slave trade altogether by law. Despite the ban, small to moderate cargoes of slaves were occasionally being illegally shipped into the United States directly from Africa for many years as late as 1859 right because this is remember the movie Amistad with Anthony Hopkins and hmm, Anthony Hopkins Matthew McConaughey and Played in in, uh, in diamonds. Tulliogi DiCaprio. What's his name? Beautiful black actor. What's his name there? Anyways, Amistad. Played in Amistad, right? And that's because it was legal to import at that. In by that time, right? 
only ones who were born. Slowly, slowly, a free black population emerged, concentrated in port cities along the Atlantic coast, from Charleston to Boston. Slaves in the cities and towns had many more privileges, but the great majority of slaves lived on southern tobacco or rice plantation, usually in groups of 20 or more. Wealthy plantation owners eventually would become so reliant on slavery that they devastated their own lower class. In years to come, the institution of slavery would be so heavily involved in the South South's economy it would divide America into two opposing forces. Some have made the claim, but today the, the emergence of the corporation. America is so divided now, the corporate financial oligarchy. And um, I mean, I haven't seen the United States of America is divided, as I'm seeing it now. The election of Donald Trump to have the Republicans and Democrats at the internal. And see the, in my lifetime, born in 1984, right? in the past life, I've lived, died in the Civil War in 1863 on the battlefields as an American. But, but uh, <coughs> pardon. But uh, not. Uh, not as divided as it is now, and some make that parallel that it's as divided as this during the civil rights era in the 60s. And even go back to how divided it was at the onset before the Civil War began. The most serious slave rebellion was the Stone Uprising in September 1739 in South Carolina. In South Carolina, the colony had about 56,000 slaves who outnumbered whites two to one. About 150 slaves rose up and seized, seizing guns and ammunition, murdered 20 whites and headed for Spanish Florida. For Spanish Florida. The local militia soon intercepted and killed most of them. This was during the, when America, of course, the United States of America was under the British, where there's still colonies, British colony, right? The colony of South Carolina. The colony had about 56 thousand slaves who outnumbered whites to the one. About 150 slaves rose up and seizing guns and ammunition murdered 20 whites and headed for Spanish Florida. The local militia soon intercepted and killed most of them. All the American colonies had slavery but it was usually the form of personal servants in the north where two percent of the people owned slaves and field hands in plantations in the south where 25 percent of people owned slaves. These statistics show the early imbalance that would eventually tip the scale and rid the United States of slave, slavery. The revolution in early America. The later half of the 18th century was a time of political upheaval in the United States. In the midst of cries for relief from British rule, people pointed out the apparent hypocrisies of slaveholders demanding freedom. The Declaration of Independence, a document that would become a manifesto for human rights and personal freedom, was written by Thomas Jefferson, who owned over 200 slaves. Thomas Jefferson owned over 200 slaves, supposedly. I believe maybe even more who owned over 200 slaves, a lot. Wow, Thomas Jefferson, I knew that he owned some slaves, but well, the number was so, so high. I think this is pretty much consensus, or less on the numbers, but wow, big slave owner, not, I couldn't argue that it's just had a few house servants, you know, two or three house servants, two, three, three or four, five, or 200 is slaves. Other southern, sl other southern statesmen were also major slaveholders. So the Declaration of Independence was written by slaveholders. The Second Continental Congress did consider consider 
freeing slaves to disrupt British commerce. They removed language from the Declaration of Independence that included a promotion of slavery amongst the offenses of King George III. A number of free blacks, most not notably Prince Hall, the founder of Prince Hall Freemasonry, Freemasonry, Freemasonic movement, Freemasonry fraternity, society, social society, secret, let's say, <laughs> submitted petitions for the end of slavery, but these petitions were largely ignored. This did not deter blacks, free and slave, from participating in the revolution. This did not deter blacks, free and slave, from participating in the revolution. This did not deter blacks, free and slave, from participating in the revolution, referring to the revolution of 1776, the Declaration of Independence, the United States of America, the colonies from Britain. Crispus Arcus, a free, cool name, love it. Crispus Atticus, a free black tradesman, was the first casualty of the Boston Massacre and of the ensuing American Revolutionary War. Free man was the first casualty of the Boston Massacre of ensuing American Revolutionary War. 5,000 blacks, including Prince Hall, fought in the Continental Army. This is important historical took a fact here uh, four thousand blacks including Prince Hall fought in the Continental Army many fought side by side with whites white white soldiers at the battles of Lexington and Concord and at Bunker Hill. But when George Washington took command in 1775, so he barred any further recruitment of blacks. Really? George Washington? He barred recruitment of blacks? What the fuck was he thinking, bro? What the fuck? Really? He barred any further recruitment of blacks? What the fuck, bro? No wonder it took you so long to to defeat the British. You barred the uh, you barred recruitment of blacks. Ish. Could have saved even white lives by not doing that. That was a bad move. Bad move for liberty. When you wash them. Oh, got an idea. On the dollar bill. Put half of my face. And half of Prince Hall's face on the US dollar bill. Prince Hall. Let's do that. Or just Prince Hall, not me. Me, yeah, forget about that. Me. Nobody. Prince Hall on the US dollar. Petition it with me. Yeah. Because George Washington is just, you know, eh. I don't know. Mm -hmm. eh. No. Anyhow, when George Washington took command in 1775, he barred any further recruitment of blacks. Approximately 5,000 free African American men helped the American colonists in their struggle for freedom. One of these men, Agri Agrippa, Agrippa, interesting, because Agrippa is a, nom is a, a Roman name, he was a Roman general consul Agrippa was so during the Jewish Roman wars Caesar was an emperor Agrippa Hall fought in the American Revolution for over six years A G R I P P A Hall Agrippa Hall corner he and the other African American soldiers fought in order to improve their white neighbors view of them and advance their own fight for f of freedom their own fight of freedom by contrast 
the British and Loyalists offered emancipation to any slave owned by a patriot who was willing to join the Loyalist forces. By contrast, the British and Loyalists offered emancipation to any slave owned by a patriot who was willing to join the, interesting, the Loyalist forces. By contrast, the British and Loyalists offered emancipation to any slave owned by a patriot who was willing to join the Loyalist forces. Lord Dunmore, the governor of Virginia, recruited 300 African-American men into his Ethiopian regiment within a month of making this proclamation. Interesting. Lord Dunmore, so Lord was um, from the British side, the Lords. May within a month of making this proclamation. In South Carolina, 25,000 slaves, more than one quarter of the total, escaped to join and fight with the British or fled for freedom in the uproar of war. Thousands of slaves also escaped in Georgia and Virginia, as well as New England and New York. Well known black loyalist soldiers include Colonel Ty and Boston King. Interesting. The Americans eventually won the war in the Provisional Treaty. They demanded the return of property, including slaves. Nevertheless, the British helped up to, to, up to 4,000 documented, uh, documented African Americans to leave the country for Nova Scotia. Nova Scotia is actually in Canada. I visited for the first time last year with my friend, my coach, and I call my sister, Jamaica and Britain rather than be returned to slavery. Thomas Peters was one of the one of the large numbers of African Americans who fought for the British. Peters was born in present day Nigeria and belonged to the Yoruba tribe and then the, ended up being captured and sold into slavery in French Louisiana. Sold again he became a slave in North Carolina and escaped his master's farm in order to receive Lord Denmore's promise of freedom. Peters fought for the British throughout the war. When the war finally ended, he and other African Americans who fought on the losing side were taken to Nova Scotia. Were taken to Nova Scotia. Here, they were given pieces of land that they could not farm. They could not farm. Why not? Interesting. Wow. Learning. See what I'm learning? Are you learning? Hopefully, I'm learning. Of course, this has to be checked, and history, and this, but in general, it's, it's accepted by historians and historian books, and this is pretty much more documented. They also did not receive the same freedoms as white Englishmen. Peters sailed to London in order to complain to the government. He arrived at a momentous time when English abolitionists were pushing a bill to Parliament to charter the Sierra Leone company and to grant it trading and settlement rights on the West African coast. Peters and the other African Americans on Nova Scotia left for Sierra Leone in 1792. Peters died soon after they arrived but the other members of his party lived on in their new home. The Constitutional Convention of 1787 sought to define the foundation for the government of the newly formed United States of America. The Constitution set forth the ideals of freedom and equality while providing for a continuation of the institution of slavery through the Fugitive Clause and the Three-Fifths Compromise. Additionally, free blacks, free blacks' rights were also restricted in many places. Most were denied the right to vote. It didn't happen until... 1963, 64, 65, 1965. Civil rights movement. Civil rights movement. Civil rights. Segregation. Right? Segregation continued until the 60s. Right, well, I think, just thinking on a stand in the Soviet. United Socialist Soviet Republics is what is known as the Soviet Union, the USSR, United Socialist Soviet Republics. In the 1960s, there was a stamp with a different period. 
people of the world, different nations, ethnicities of the world, races. I see the world. different kind, one race. I believe we're one race. Now I don't believe that we were fundamentally one race, human. Um, but anyways, and this they had them like children holding hands together, and they were. Holding hand while there were segregation, blacks and whites and Asians and other peoples together. Well, that's the United States. There was still segregation. It's a beautiful stamp, very cool. Anyways, additionally, free blacks' rights were also restricted in many places. Most were denied the right to vote and were excluded from public school. Some blacks sought to fight these. Contradictions, contradictions, we'll say, immoralities, unethically, unlawful, in court. In 1780, Elizabeth Freeman and Quack, Quack Walker, Quack, Q U O C K, used language from the new Massachusetts Constitution that declared all men were born free and equal in freedom suits to gain release from slavery. A free black businessman in Boston named Paul Cuffey sought to be excused from paying taxes since he had no voting no voting rights. Interesting, good for you, Paul Cuffey. Paul Cuffey. C U F F E. Have a coffee. Try it. In the northern states, the revolutionary spirit did help African Americans. Beginning in the 1750s, there were widespread sentiment during the American Revolution that slavery was a social evil for the country as a whole and for the whites that should eventually be abolished. All the northern states passed Emancipation Acts between 1780 and 1804. Most of these arranged for gradual emancipation and a special status for freed men, so there were still a, do a dozen permanent apprentices into the 19th century. In 1787, Congress passed the Northwest Ordinance and barred slavery from the large Northwest Territory. In 1790, there were more than 59,000 free blacks in the United States. By 1810, that number had risen to 186,446. Most of these were in the North but revolutionary sentiments also motivated southern slaveholders for 20 years after the revolution more southerners also freed slaves sometimes by manumission or in wills to be accomplished after the slaveholders death in the upper south the percentage of free blacks rose from about one percent before the revolution to more than 10 percent by 1810 Quakers and Moravians worked to persuade slaveholders to free families. In Virginia, the number of free blacks increased from 10,000 in 1790 to nearly 30,000 in 1810. But 95%, 95% of blacks were still enslaved. 95% of blacks were still enslaved. In Delaware, three quarters. In Delaware, three quarters of all blacks were free by 1810. By 1860, just over 91% of Delaware's blacks were free, and 49.1% of those in Maryland. By 1860, just over 91% of Delaware's blacks were free, and 49.1% of those in Maryland. Among the successful freemen was Benjamin Banneker, B-A-N-N-E-K-E-R, Banneker, a Maryland astronomer, mathematician, almanac author, surveyor, and farmer who in 1791 assisted in the initial survey of the boundaries of the future District of Columbia. Interesting. Benjamin Banneker. Freeman was a Maryland astronomer, mathematician, and author of 1791. Despite the challenges of living in the new country, most free blacks fared far better than the nearly 800,000 enslaved blacks. Even so, many considered 
emigrating to Africa. Religion in Black America and Black Church By 1800, a small number of slaves had joined Christian churches. Three blacks in the north had set up networks of churches up in the south. The slaves sat in the upper gallery. Central to the growth of community among blacks was the black church, usually the first community institution to be established. The black church was both an expression of community and unique African-American spirituality and the reaction to discrimination. The church also served as neighborhood centers where free black people could celebrate their Africans, Africans, African heritage without intrusion by white detractors. The church also the church also the center of education. The church was the church was a missing was was The church, it is a missing W-A-S here. Where's the wasp? Where's the wasp? The church is also the center of education. Here's the wasp. W-A-S. to the center of education here's the boss. now here's from the world my black african-american brothers and sisters from my office where I write poetry study learn write spiritual theories and practice and where is mine headquarters for artistic art creation script writing songwriting and Rapping, singing, dancing. Of education, so let's continue the educating ourselves on Black History Month. Since the church was part of the community and wanted to provide education, they educated the free and enslaved blacks. Seeking autonomy, some blacks like Richard Allen Bishop founded separate black denominations. The Second Great Awakening, 1800-1830s, has been called the central and defining event in the development of Afro-Christianity, interestingly enough. So 33%, um, no 33, not 33%. Abu J. Rabatou, Slave Religion and Invisible Institution in Atabel South in 1978. So this period called the Second Great Awakening, 1800-1830s, has been called the central and defining event in the development of Afro-Christianity. The Second Great Awakening, 1830s, has been called the central and defining event in the development of Afro-Christianity. The antebellum period. As the United States grew, the institution of slavery became more entrenched in the southern states, while northern states began to abolish it. Pennsylvania was the first in 1780, passing an act for gradual abolition. Abolition. A number of events continued to shape views on slavery. One of these events was the Haitian Revolution, which was the only slave revolt that led to an independent country. It's a fact, yeah. The knew this before I've learned about it. It's a fact. One of these events was the Haitian Revolution, which was the only slave revolt that led to an independent country. One of these events was the Haitian Revolution, which was the only slave revolt that led to an independent country, which still exists today. It's known as Haiti. Many slave owners fled. Actually, they did the Haitian Revolution. Many slave and would men too. Many slave owners fled to the United States with tales of horror massacre that alarmed southern whites the invention of the cotton gin cotton gin in the 1790s 
allowed the cultivation of short staple cotton, which could be grown in much of the deep south, where warm weather and proper soil conditions prevailed. The Industrial Revolution in Europe and New England generated a heavy demand for cotton, for cheap clothing, which caused an exponential demand for slave labor to develop new cotton plantations. There was a 70% increase in the number of slaves in the United States in only 20 years. 70%, that's a hell of a lot. So for each 100, they were added 70. 70%, right? It's 70 on 100. So for each 100 slaves that existed, in about 20 years, 70 more were added. They were overwhelmingly concentrated on plantations in the Deep South. And Deep South refers mostly to Alabama, right? Um, Louisiana, right? Because that's South Carolina, Deep South, Georgia. And moved west as old cotton fields lost their productivity and new lands were purchased. Unlike the northern states who put more focus into manufacturing and commerce, the south was heavily dependent on agriculture. Southern political economists at this time supported the institution by concluding that nothing was inherently contradictory about owning slaves and that a future of slavery existed even if the South were to industrialize. Note 37. Antebellum Southern political economist and the problem of slavery. American 19th century history. Colander J. I have only September 2006. Note 37. Note 37. Racial, economic, and political turmoil reached an all-time high regarding slavery after the events of the Civil War. Racial, economic, and political turmoil reached an all-time high regarding slavery after the events of the Civil War. Racial, economic, and political turmoil reached an all-time high regarding slavery after the events of the Civil War. In 1807, at the urging of President Thomas Jefferson, Congress abolished the international slave trade. While American blacks celebrated this as a victory in the fight against slavery, the ban increased the demand for slaves, changing agricultural practices in the Upper South from tobacco to mixed farming, decreased labor requirements, and slaves were sold to traders for the developing South, Deep South, that is. In addition, the Fugitive Slave Act of 1793 allowed any black person to be claimed as a runaway unless a white person testified on their behalf. A number of free blacks, especially indentured children, were kidnapped and sold into slavery with little or no hope of rescue. By 1819, there were exactly 11 free and 11 slave states, which increased sectionalism that's a term political geographical social philosophical kind of term for this sections right this section free slave free slave, free slave by 1819 there were exactly 11 free and 11 slave states which increased sectionalism amazing right? 11 11 by 1819 there were exactly 11 free and 11 slave states which increased sectionalism fears of an imbalance in congress led to the, to the 1820 Missouri Compromise that required states to be admitted to the Union in pairs, one slave and one free. In 1850, after winning the Mexican War, a crisis gripped the nation what to do about the territories won from Mexico. So there was this American-Mexican War in 1850, and because that's why you have the states of New Mexico, right? Like cities, big cities actually, and part of a lot of part of California, Baja California, Loca, a big part of California, up to San. So the names are Hispanic, right? San Francisco. I have the Spanish cookies, but San Francisco is Saint. San is a Spanish term for Saint. So you had Saint Francisco, right, from the Catholic Church history. And you have Los Angeles, the Angels, City of Angels, right? Los means the Angeles Angels. 
Yeah, New Mexico, of course, and part of Texas, big part of Texas. Was part of uh, New Mexico before. Was part of Mexico, New Mexico, Arizona, part of Arizona, right? Part of California, Arizona. If not all of California, major part of it, California, Arizona, New Excelsior. See, in this it can, in this compromise, the territories of New Mexico, Arizona, Utah, Utah, yeah, Utah also, and Nevada, Nevada, of course, yeah, it's close to California, right? Nevada would be reorganized, but the issue of slavery would be decided later. So in this compromise, the compromise referring to the after the war with uh, Henry Clay, the compromise of 1820, the Missouri Compromise. In the compromise, the territories of New Mexico, Arizona, Utah, and Nevada would be organized, but the issue of slavery would be decided later. Washington, D.C. would abolish the slave trade, but not slavery itself. California would be admitted as a free state, but the South would receive a new Fugitive Slave Act while which required northerners to return slaves who escaped the north to their owners. The Compromise of 1850 would maintain a shaky peace until the election of Lincoln in 1860. Compromise. In 1851, the battle between slaves and slave owners was met in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. Yeah, well, she have a class, no? I'll be one minute and then... Uh, when do you want to leave? 7.30? The Christiana riot incident demonstrated, demonstrated a growing conflict between states' rights and the federal legislature on the issue of slavery. Issue of slavery. Abolitionism. Abolitionists in Britain and the United States in the 1840 and 60 period developed large complex propaganda campaigns against slavery. Stam says, though abolitionists never argue that the physical treatment of slaves had any decisive bearing on the issue of the morality of slaves, their propaganda emphasized not exaggerated cruelties and trust for the purpose of winning converts. It says, Coffee with Dragon, Black History Month. 